so it's been quite a while. Um, I've now handed in my PhD thesis for examination. I'm just awaiting my final examination, which will happen at the end of the month. First thing, I'd just like to thank all of you who have stuck around and watching this now, and to the nearly 1,000 of you who subscribed when I really wasn't making a great deal of content. Um, hopefully, I'll make stuff that was worth your subscription. So, thanks for watching. None of us would really be here if it weren't for a number of weird little viruses. Mammals as we know them probably wouldn't exist or be very different. The crux of the story is how do you carry and develop a fetus inside a womb without allowing the immune system to attack and destroy it? In all mammals there exist these kind of viruses called endogenous retroviruses. These are not really active viruses anymore in the, in the way we tend to think of viruses and they've been with us for millions upon millions of years. They're as much a part of us as any other gene inside our body. Some of them even seem to have been within our bodies, then escaped as viruses and then come back again. Unlike other viruses which tend to infect and actually damage us and hurt us in some way, endogenous retroviruses or ERVs seem to be essential for mammalian life. They seem to be deeply involved in the production and regulation of the placenta, an adaptation which has helped mammals spread to every corner of the planet. So there's a number of things we should talk about here. First, can endogenous retroviruses ever be reanimated? Can they ever become virulent again? Or, can, or do they hurt us in any way? And the second being, what impact have they had on our evolution? In the previous series, I talked at length about what makes a pathogen, not particularly surprising given the name of the series. Endogenous retroviruses do it seem to have the ability to become virulent, but virulence probably the wrong word here. They have the ability to reduce the fitness of their host, and not in the common way with other viruses, which reduce our fitness by breaking down our tissues and using them to reproduce themselves and spreading, causing symptoms that will spread the disease around, such as sneezing and coughing, or generally mucking around with our cellular processes. Endogenous retroviruses reduce our fitness in a different way. They seem to be linked to how our immune systems recognize ourselves. Also, how our immune systems recognize foreign intruders. In cells that are exposed to outside bacteria, such as the lining of your gut and immune cells, the regulation of endogenous retroviruses seems to be regulated by the presence of these foreign objects, these foreign bacteria and other organisms. This is likely due to the fact that they seem to, as I said, re help regulate the immune system. So in cases where bacteria have learnt clever tricks to subvert the immune system, it seems that turning on endogenous retroviruses could actually reduce the fitness of the host. So there is a way that they can hurt you, but the majority of the time it seems that they're actually necessary and very useful for the existence of our species and all mammals. ERVs have also been linked to autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis. They've also been linked to some psychiatric diseases such as schizophrenia. However, the jury is still out on this sort of work. It's not to say it's wrong, it's just it hasn't yet conclusively been shown that there's an actual relationship between ERVs and psychiatric disorders and even autoimmune diseases. So I for one look forward to seeing what the sort of research brings forward. So what about the impact on the evolution of mammals? Well there's a lot of work that's looked into endogenous retroviruses and the placenta. The placenta is possibly the second most complicated human organ after the brain of course. It has to do a myriad of different responsibilities that we normally have whole organs to do. For example it has to be responsible for oxygen transportation, it has to get rid of waste and it has to produce nutrients or get nutrients across from the mother to the infant. It also seems to be a hotbed of ERV activity Endogenous retroviruses are highly active inside the placenta, and this has been suggested for a number of reasons. The first being that this is ideal place for endogenous retroviruses to transmit to a new host, the infant. In the placenta, the ERVs can spread to the germline cells and be incorporated into every single cell in the new body. A second reason suggested is that the fitness cost of having a high number of ERVs in the placenta isn't particularly high because the placenta is only a short-term organ, only lasts for less than nine months. So it's produced and then lost. The counter of this is obviously the placenta is very important for the survival of our species, it's very important for the fitness as it's directly related to the burying of offspring. But this brings us to a third point which says that ERVs actually are essential 
for the production and maintenance of the placenta and the fetus. So none of these are really mutually exclusive and it could be a combination of all three or even more things coming together to mean why endogenous retroviruses have such a high activity inside placentas. So what are they actually doing inside the placenta? You probably know the most famous retrovirus, which is HIV. It has an amazing ability to modulate and even destroy the human immune system. Retroviruses seem to have quite a good knack at mucking about with the immune system. It seems that the endogenous retroviruses inside the placenta become active in order to temper the mother's immune system away from the placenta in a number of different ways. I believe most people are familiar with the idea that the immune system is there to clear foreign objects out of the body, be they bacterial, viruses, even man-made things like plastics. If the immune system recognizes something as being foreign, it will try and destroy it and remove it. So the mother's immune system would recognize a child as being foreign. You might think that because mother and baby are genetically similar, the immune system wouldn't really worry about it, but the baby and mother only share about 50% of the DNA, and that's not enough for the immune system. The immune system would recognize that as being foreign and try and destroy it. There are a few cases where, unfortunately, this does happen during pregnancies. It's very rare, but it can be tragic when this happens. Our immune systems are incredibly complex. I use this as an opportunity to plug the immune system video I helped make with Kyrgyzstats, which I read through their script to make sure they didn't have any mistakes in it. Check it out, they make fantastic videos. Look at through the rest of the stuff on their channel, it's all amazing. In order for the immune system to be effective, it has to get to the site of infection. So when it's traveling through the bloodstream and it detects that there's an infection happening somewhere in the body, it will travel along, say, the blood vessel to the point where it gets to the close bit of the infection. And then it will release these signal molecules that tell the cells to move out of the way. So the, the junctions between the cells will open up and the immune cells can slip in between. This is actually how Ebola kills people. It tricks the immune system into releasing these cytokine signal molecules and the blood vessels fall apart because they go into overdrive producing this sort of signal molecule and they all just let go of each other. The structure of the placenta is uniquely different from other tissues however. Instead of having a number of these cells forming tight junctions which the immune system could open up and slip in between, it forms a single continuous layer. So the junctions disappear and the way this happens is an endogenous retrovirus turns on a protein which tells the cells actually to fuse their membranes together. This is called a syncytotroph blast. So instead of having these tight junctions which the immune cells could make use of and get to the parasite which they believe is there, the baby, they actually can't make it through. The immune cells do detect, it seems, the presence of the child in the bloodstream through antibodies being released and stuff getting through and out, but they can't physically get through. However, another human endogenous retrovirus, HERV, FRD, does seem to temper the immune system. It releases a glycoprotein which has an immune modulating effect. This incorporated in our genome around 40 million years ago before the split between old and new world monkeys. The interesting thing about this endogenous retrovirus is it shares a very large part of its genome with viruses like Ebola. Up to 80% of its genetic material is identical to Ebola. This ERV doesn't turn off the immune system, it just modulates it. This means that the immune system is still active against other bacteria and viruses. So the mother's immune system carry on fighting infections, but ignores the would-be parasite that is the fetus across the placenta. I've only really scratched the surface of ERVs, and there is so much cool stuff I could have talked about, like using them to prove common descent with modification, or looking at the way they might affect autoimmune diseases, but I'll leave that for another time. Next time I'm going to talk about commensal bacteria, and I'm also producing a series about vaccinations. Hopefully this will be a three-part series looking at a range of different things, not so much the history, but moving more into why people aren't getting vaccinated, why they should get vaccinated, etc, etc. So hopefully you'll join me for those two, and until then, I'll see you then, and thanks for watching.